Hey friends, it is Wednesday and it's Ask a Flower Farmer. And here, guess what? There's a flower farmer here to answer your questions. Folks, it is Lisa Mason Ziegler and thanks so much for joining me here today. I have such exciting things to tell you today. Um, and I just remembered, I, I forgot almost one of the most important ones. Um, I'm so glad you're here and this is the way this works. So if you would like for me to try to answer your question, um, if you have a question about flower farming, growing cut flowers, starting seeds, um, anything, conditioning flowers, when to start, farm dogs even, even especially since I have one whining in the background here, um, post your questions down below in the little circle with the question mark and I will do my best to try to give it an answer. And while I'm waiting for y'all to get some questions in there, I have so many things to share. First off, y'all, did you know that we have a new family member in the Gardener's Workshop lineup? We are now offering the new Swift Soil Blocker, the mini that was actually made for our green trays, the 75 and the 27. And friends, tomorrow night at 7 p.m., I'm doing a special live event inside our app talking about it, showing, saying what, how I'm going to use it, what I'm going to use it for. And um, so join me over there. So that is 7 p.m. tomorrow night inside the Gardener's Workshop live app. And I will be highlighting all about the new Swift Soil Blocker that is coming alongside our Ladbrook blockers. If you are a flower farmer or a commercial grower, you definitely want to check this out. They're already live on our website, on our big website, so you can go in and check it out. Um, we have kits. We're selling them separately. We have the scraper seeder, um, and we are totally and completely stoked. You know, they're made right here in the United States, up in Michigan, and we are just super thrilled and honored um, that we are being able to offer them to you. So be sure to check that out. So that's inside the Gardener's Workshop app, Thursday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Be there or be square, friends. All right. This Saturday, on Seed Start and Saturday, I am going to be talking about something. We're already hearing it, y'all. What is today? April 5th? People are already thinking they've missed starting seeds. Folks, I am here to tell you, I don't care where you live. There are seeds to be started all the time, just about. Unless you're in the north and it's dead of winter, maybe it's not quite the time yet. But it is not too late. And so Saturday, I'm going to talk a little bit about timing and just how the retail world has kind of made us think we're late, but you're not really late. And so we're going to talk about that. And then today, inside the app for my Express Wednesday show at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, I'm sharing what I'm starting, and I'm going to do a little in-depth dive on the different seeds that we're starting right now. Um, I left Bobo at the farm. I just got here, um, Tucker and I did, and left Bobo at home. So we have got so many seeds. Literally, I counted last week, um, and so this is not an accurate number. Last week, what is today, Wednesday? It was probably last Friday. I counted. We had over 11,000 seedlings you know, and counting. So we have tons of seedlings coming along. And friends, if you missed my announcement last night, or if you're not on our email list, you may or may not know that guess what? My Flower Farm and School Online course is now available to purchase. Um, and so we are so excited about that. And you can watch on YouTube um, or the Instagram live in my feed. I talked about that last night and nothing has made me happier um, in business and the business world than that did um, by being able to now have ways to offer help to people when they need it. Um, there was nothing more heartbreaking to me than you guys reaching out. And how many times here on Ask a Flower Farmer, people would say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have to wait until the fall to enroll in your course, right? Um, so now it's on demand and we have a very special offer going on right now. Um, that you can learn all about it on the Gardener's Workshop homepage. So check that out. Um, and it has been, we have just tweaked it into an awesome tool. So now I see I have some questions. So let's see what's on you guys' mind today. <sighs> Katie Quinn, I planted geranium seeds and they came up great, but now they are turning black from the bottom up. I have kept them watered. I don't understand what is happening. Well, I can honestly say I have never grown geraniums from seed, 
But I would say if they're turning black from the bottom up, I bet it's overwatering. Overwatering is a really common problem with seeds. Um, I mean, it's really kind of hard. That is definitely a challenge, even for seasoned growers. Um, so I don't know what you're growing them in, um, Kat, but I would say the goal that we try to establish with our seed starting is that we water in the morning. We water thoroughly with no standing water, no residual water with the um, where that has access to the bottom of your container or the bottom of your block, whatever you're using, um, and that they go through the day and they the blocks or your trays dry out by tomorrow morning at the time that you would go to water. And if they are not drying out in a 24-hour period, then they're staying moist. And that, I would guess, I would guess that is what the problem is. But honestly, I don't know anything about geraniums. But that's my guess. Last year, my snaps had rust. The landscape fabric still has rust on it. Will washing it work or toss it out? So, y'all, I'm getting all these questions that I just don't have a whole lot of experience with today. So, we don't grow in landscape fabric for a lot of different reasons. Um, and rust and snapdragons, the only time I've ever had rust and snaps is when I have tried to plant them in spring, which is much, much later than we have ever, ever planted them. We typically plant them in the fall or in very early spring, which is up to eight weeks before your last spring frost. Um, which for us would have been the middle of February. When we plant later in the season, um, they they prefer cool to cold soil and to grow in cool conditions. And when they don't get that, they fall victim to disease and pests. Um, so rust, def rust is spores, right? And so that means, yes, if it's on whatever your, your landscape fabric, um, I don't know anything about cleaning that up. That is something I would probably enter into a search engine um, and see what that has to say. But I would be more um, interested in figuring out how to prevent you from getting rust because I'm in the South. If I can grow snapdragons without getting rust, everybody really should be able to. And in my experience, it really boils down to the timing of the planting is what really gives you a step up to not have to, to deal with that. All right, let's see what else we got. When a seed says to plant a half inch deep, how do you do that in the small blocker? So that's a great question, Kathleen. So when it says half inch deep, that means that the seed typically needs darkness to sprout. And that usually is larger, medium to larger size seeds. And so usually that means that I would be using probably the two inch soil blocker. Um, and now we can add to our lineup. If you're a commercial grower, meaning you need to make a lot more blocks at one time quicker and more efficiently, I would use the t mini 27 swift blocker. Um, so you can, um, if you did the two inch blocker, you just push the seed down into the block further. And you do that, we do that with a toothpick. Um, and that's one of the things I was kind of a, an interesting find. You know, we, um, we have those toothpick dispensers that you see that we use with our, our part of our kits. And um, so Bobo and I have one of those each at home for seed sowing. Well, the toothpicks that are in there actually are much heavier duty toothpicks than what you get, you know, what you buy, you know, at the grocery store. And they're totally flat, blunt on one end. They are so good for pushing seeds. Like I was sowing a bunch of tomatoes, um, the tomatoes are like this tall, so it's probably like last week, seven to ten days ago, and they need darkness. So I would drop a seed on the top of each block, and then I use the toothpick with the flat end to just tip it up on its side and just push it right down into the block, and it worked really, really beautifully. Um, so to create that darkness, which is what indicates when it says cover it with soil, you push it deeper into the block, and that will create darkness and do what it needs to do. Hope that helps. Any tips on getting rid of aphids? Sidewalk Blooms asks. So this is aphid time of the year. That is for sure. So, and again, you know, y'all, what you're going to probably figure out about me after you hang around for a little while is to not have to figure out what to do about something like aphids. 
for me, the first thing I think of is why do I have aphids, right? Now, there are surely plants at this time of the year that are very predisposed to aphids. Um, you know, sweet peas, um, asclepias, which is butterfly weed, those are just natural attractants, and it's all about science, right? But often cases, and rudbeckias actually, actually there's a rudbeckia aphid, um, but oftentimes what we find is plants that get infestations of aphids are really because they're being fertilized more than they really need, and it's creating all this fresh, fleshy growth that they're attracted to. So, that's one of the reasons that I am on the low spectrum of fertilizing usually. Um, so I'm always trying to not make my plant leaves more inviting um, to some of the pests and aphids are a great one. So when I get aphids, what I typically do is first off, um, you know, my our rule of thumb is um, our friend Jessica Walliser, who is the author of several beneficial bug books, good bug, bad bug, best bug book ever. It's the first bug book every person should get. If you don't know a lot about bugs yet and you don't understand the whole concept, that little book, and you can find it, of course, on the big book seller, um, is coded so you can actually take it out to your garden. But it, first off, it tells you the bad bugs, the first half of the book, and the second half, which it's a little spiral bound book, tells you the good bugs. And then it shows you what they look like as adults and as larvae. And it tells you if it's a bad bug, should you even bother doing anything? So that is step one if you're new in the bug world. Um, Good Bug, Bad Bug by Jessica Walliser. Then she has so many other books. I mean, she is hooked on beneficial insects. Um, and But the Good Bug, Bad Bug is the way to start. And so what you'll learn in that book is that ladybugs, there's a lot of other books, um, beneficial bugs that also eat aphids, um, but ladybugs, of course, are the poster child, and it's actually when they're in the larva stage, which most people don't recognize, um, is when they really do eat a lot of those aphids that you're having. So, first off, I try to step away and allow nature to take her course. If there's not, if they're not overwhelmed in aphids, it's like, all right, I'll give them time. Just step away. But if you have a really heavy infestation, I will then potentially either take a squirt bottle with just water with a strong stream and kind of rub the foliage and, you know, get kill some of them and wash them off. Or you could use a hose. Um, just depends on what you've got. Um, but we don't use any pesticides, organic or otherwise. I don't use neem oil. I don't use any of those things. We just don't find it necessary. Um, so if you can kind of beat back the population a little bit and give the good bugs time to get in there to get them, that is the best case scenario, I would say. Crooked letter roots. Is there a formula or simple way to calculate how many seedlings to place in a given space? I know varieties come into play, but just a baseline for a given space. I'm sure there's a square foot count, and but that's not the way that I calculate um, seedlings. So, I mean, we typically plant pretty much everything, four rows to a bed, um, six inches between plants. Um, and so you could do the math of that. And so, I mean, I just do the simple math of that. Four times, you know, I'm not gonna do it here for you, but. Yes, but there are people that, Dave Dowling thinks in square foot numbers, as does Gretel and Steve Adams, and it's all just the way that your mind works. So that is our go-to formula, is four rows to a bed, um, six inches between the plants in the rows, and it's in a 30-inch wide bed. Um, so that's basically how we, you know, there's a few plants that aren't that way. You know, we don't grow peppers. Um, hairy balls, big plants, Triloba rudbeckia, which is a huge plant. Um, but in general, that is um, the, what we follow. I feel like, let's see what this says. I feel like I can't get all the little bugs off my flowers when I start arrangements like little white spiders. So first off, spiders are some of the best bug eaters ever. You don't want to kill spiders. But let me show you how what I actually do when um, we're harvesting out in the field. And so we, we never take buckets down the aisles. We use a trailer or a golf cart or um, 
something. It's got our buckets at the end of the end of the aisles, right? So we're cutting the flowers. So I'm cutting, I'm cutting, and when my hand is full, um, I am walking towards the trailer or whatever it is, and I'm cutting the ends even. And then as soon as I get that done, I usually split the bunch into two hands and just let my arms go straight and kind of gently swat them against my legs to dislodge anybody that I don't want to take indoors. Um, in general, we don't really see many insects after I do that. And some flowers are heavier are more attractive at certain times to certain pests and bugs, right? Um, so that's what we do is just hang them up. I mean, just let your arms drop down by your sides. So the blooms are facing down and you're not swatting them hard. You're just gently swatting them against your leg as I'm walking along um, to just get anybody off there. And that generally does a good job. I mean, we sold to, flo we don't use any pesticides, as I mentioned earlier. We sold to florist um, for 25 years. And I don't know that we ever had a pest call. We never had anybody say there's bugs on my flowers or what do I do about these bugs? Um, and we don't do anything, you know, I mean, it's just this, it's part of the steps of our harvesting, um, keeping our eyes peeled. And if there is an issue, pests or insects need to be squared away out in the garden, right? Hey friends, I can't even believe I got all your questions answered. Um, so what's everybody starting you know, are you, um, you know, we're right on the cusp of our, we're deep in our warm season tender annual seed starting, but we aren't planting them outside yet. Um, we were actually talking about potentially doing some tomorrow, um, but we have a 44 degree night coming next week, so we probably won't do that. Um, so I'm looking now, I see some in the comments. I'll, do you plant sunflower successions next to sunflowers already growing in the field or do you have an entirely different place, space to plant them? Do you plant? So our goal, so she's talking about, she must know about our, our weekly sunflower sowing, um, that we do every week in our effort to have sunflowers to harvest every week, right? I mean, that's the easiest cash cow you can actually add to your lineup. Um, and so our goal is, but we rarely get to do it 100%, <clears throat> is actually um, to not plant, I'll plant one bed with multiple plantings of sunflowers, but I try not to put bed after bed after bed of sunflowers just to help control disease. Sunflowers do get powdery mildew, and that is a real problem. You get powdery mildew, you're done for sunflowers for the season. So you really want to take steps to kind of diversify your plantings. Um, and so we try not to put, and when we were in high production, we got stuck. I mean, we just didn't have enough space. We often had six or seven hundred foot beds of sunflowers. Back then it was a whole bed was one week planting. Um, we would put, we would have several beds together and all is fine until you get some bacteria spot going or heaven forbid you get back um, powdery mildew because um, it'll shut your operation down for sunflowers anyway. Um, so rotating, moving them and trying not to, I have no problem planting an entire bed but to try to keep those beds sporadically throughout your garden would be the most beneficial. And again, I don't, it doesn't always work out that way for me. Sometimes I, um, they are, you'll, you'll see them in pictures and stuff that we do on the farm that we often do have them that way. So I hope that helps. It is a good precaution. Um, several years ago, Steve and Gretel Adams, um, and, you know, they're in Ohio. They have 18 hooping greenhouses. They're big growers. Um, and I guess I'm guessing five or six years ago is probably longer than that. Um, they got powdery mildew and they have a huge business. Sunflowers were very important to them. They got powdery mildew and they couldn't grow sunflowers for like two years um, while they fixed their problem. And so it's worth taking steps to do whatever you have to do. That's back to what I was saying earlier about why do you have aphids? Um, you know, I mean, it's like, why do you have rust on that fabric? The big win in farming and gardening is preventing the problem from ever occurring. That's the most 
efficient, high dollar thing you can actually do, right? Let's see what Pam has to say. I have leaf spot. Oh, now it went away. See, that's why we can't do them in the comments. Sorry, now I see there's more. To, maybe it's down here. Another question. When germinating straw flower scabiosis, does the skirt go up? I've done both ways. And I'm struggling to get them to germinate. Um, so, skirt up means a, a mini scabiosis, not all of the seed, because we have it even within the different colors. Some have the little, we call it like a little badminton um, thing that you, when you play in badminton, I don't know what you actually call that thing. That's exactly what it looks like, but the skirt is a great way to describe that. Um, we put the pointy end in first, push it down. It needs cool temperatures. Um, I was just, you know, all y'all, my manuscript was supposed to have gone in last week, but they gave me an extra week. I didn't ask for it. So I'm um, reviewing all of this stuff and scabbies in the book. Um, I can't remember what the actual temperature is, but we put it pointy end down, um, cool temperatures, and I can't remember if it gets covered or not. So I can't answer beyond that. Um, is that's actually what we do. Tanya asked, do you always transplant tomatoes? Oh, yeah. I mean, you always transplant. I mean, we transplant everything. Um, and except for a handful of stuff that we don't transplant that is fall planted, cool season, hardy annuals. Most commercial growers do. It's easier, it's quicker, and you get a better stand of plants with a lot less work. So that's why we actually do that. And um, tomatoes will not, you have to wait till the soil gets really hot outside for it to actually pop, and then it may not um, actually let you um, make fruit before the time is up. Do you pinch peppers? So funny you should say that. Lane and I just did a... Um, Insta did a podcast this morning about our new pepper that's coming online. It's a special cut flower pepper that we're actually growing the seed for. And you do pinch it um, because we want branches, right? But I do understand that some people, I don't grow them as, I can't eat peppers, so I don't grow them in my garden for veggies. But if it is for a ornamental cut flower, we pinch. All right, I'm... Looking here. What's the best way to get rid of white mold that is starting to show up on seedlings? Is it possible to slightly underwater to get it to go away, or is the seedling automatically lost as if they get white mold? So there is actually, um, if you don't already listen to, you need to check out our podcast called Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. And we talked about growing stuff on your blocks. And that was one of the things that we talked about. So I would definitely recommend that you go and check. It's available on podcasts everywhere, Seed Talk. And it was just in the last week or two. And if it's, I think it's already out. Um, but yes, growing mold and algae is a result of constant moisture. You do not want your blocks moist all the time. You want them to be wet, get dry as the day goes on, get even drier overnight. And they're dry the next morning for you to water again. Mold and algae really can't survive in those conditions. So correcting the constant moisture problem is what will actually fix that for you. But check out Seed Talk. Which perennials, if any, do you grow for cut flowers? Also, which bulbs and corms? Um, in fact, I do not grow any real bulbs and corms um, or perennials. I am a small space flower farmer. I mean, I'm in the middle of the city. It's an urban farm. Oh, my. Here we come with the bug book. She's, she, she's a big geek. Rhonda is as big a geek over bugs as I am. Just lots of beetles. That's the, yeah. Look at all these beetles. This is... Dr. Evans, the beetle book, which we absolutely love. Look at all the different ladybugs. I mean, there's tons. And their babies look different. And their babies look. You got a picture of a baby in there? No. There's not a baby in there? I can't believe it. Oh, my goodness, y'all. So that's why you got to have a good bug book. You've got to get a good bug book. Um, so the reason I don't grow perennials, I do grow peonies because they were gifted to me. I get about, and ours are on the verge of blooming, actually. We get about a 1,000 stems. Perennials take up year-round space. 
I want to produce as many flowers from the smallest space as possible, and you do that with annuals. So I never left the annual corral, y'all. Um, so I typically do not do bulbs and corms. I used to. I went through a, sp a, a spell of doing that, you might say, but I soon learned it is far more profitable to grow annuals, um, high dollar seeds and all. Um, I grow annuals year round and um, it's not that there's anything wrong with perennials. They take a lot more care than what people think because you know perennials take up real estate year round, which means they have to be weeded all the time. They have to be lifted and split every three years to continue producing properly. You have to water them and you have to feed them. I mean, it's a lot more work than most people think and I can turn more bucks in my space growing annuals than I can from perennials, bulbs, or corms. Um, so sorry. Chrissy, I'm planting my Lizzie plugs this weekend. Next week, I'm supposed to be unusually warm in Iowa. At what point do I need to worry about rosetting? Rosetting is really created during the seedling stage. Um, I, I would have to actually read up on that. Um, the, the rosetting is... Um, I, what I like to say is that Lysianthus holds a grudge. If you don't give it the conditions that it needs at certain points in its growing up life, um, it does what's called rosetting. And rosetting means it never produces stems with flowers. It just gets beautiful vegetation. It's the most heartbreaking thing ever. This is why we tell people we really recommend you buy plugs. Um, you can start Lysianthus, getting it to germinate is not the problem. It's that growing up, keeping it under 70 degrees the whole time. Um, but I will tell you, Chris, that we here in the South, I mean, we plant ours in February. I mean, it's already, it's at 80 degrees here today and it'll, my, ours will be fine. So once they're 16 weeks old and being planted out in the garden, I think you're all right. Don't worry about it. Because what choice do you have at this point? You cannot control the temperatures outside, right? What do you grow for the screen between your farm and the subdivision, the tall one that your dog, yeah, he loves to get in. Um, it's a native mixed border. It's a mix of native shrubs, trees. Um, there's a couple perennials in there like mountain mint that grow, but in general, it's all shrubs and trees. And I worked with a native plant landscape designer. Um, she actually came to my farm and we walked the hedgerows that were in the farm next to me that were like 200 years old that were destroyed when they built houses to see what was in there so that we could provide that same kind of home base to beneficial insects and such um so and birds so we just planted those native things and that would be whatever is native in your both deciduous and evergreens um and it is packed with wildlife the birds are unbelievable in there um so we're really really pleased with it never have enough screen though let's see what is this so this is my last question oh think you have a truck Rhonda. I have started my tomatoes in my seed blocker. They are not growing much, so should I replant into a bigger container before I plant into the garden? So we do bump up. I mean, our tomatoes are growing like gangbusters. We started them last week, and some of them are already this tall. They're pretty beautiful. Um, and so when stuff is stops growing, no matter what it is, tomatoes or otherwise, usually it's from a couple of reasons. The number one reason is overwatering staying wet all the time. Roots need as much, much oxygen as they do water, y'all. And if they are not dry for a portion of the day, like I talk about all the time, they just are not get. they're drowning in there, even though they might not be sitting in water. If the soil is wet, and one reason that soil stays wet all the time is because the air temperature is not warm enough. And so that's what you need to figure out. Now, we do bump our tomato seedlings that we start in the three quarter inch block or up to the two inch block um, because we want to get them bigger to go to the garden because we have a real cut worm problem on our farm um, and smaller transplants they'll they'll hit the ground running if a cut worm doesn't hit them so we do bump them up but can almost promise you they're too wet all the time um, warm up the air temperature and see if that does not fix your problem so friends that was my last question i can take today um so remember we have new members 
in the family of the Gardener's Workshop. The Swift Commercial Soil Blockers are now with us. We are carrying the Mini 25, I'm sorry, the Mini 75 and the Mini 27. And I'm going to be talking about them and showing them and how we use them tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, what is tomorrow? I think it's the 6th. Today is Wednesday. Um, tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, inside the Gardener's Workshop app, I'll be um, showing it, talking about showing some seedlings we've grown in it. And, I, and um, I'm pretty stoked about it as commercial growers, right? Um, and we will um, talk about that. And then don't forget, today at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, inside the Gardener's Workshop app, we're doing the Express Show. And I'm going through the stuff I'm starting right now. And I am going to... Um, kind of like give you the 411 on what I'm actually talking about. The Living Stones. My kids love watching the lady who talks about flowers every Wednesday and Friday. Oh, give them a cookie. <laughs> All right, friends. Can't wait. I hope if you aren't already in flower farming school, now is your opportunity to get in. Um, we have a really special offer going on right now. In addition to my course, which is slam packed full of information and our private community and, 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 um, it's, we're give for a limited time. We're offering Ellen Frost preparing to sell to florist workshop and my cool flowers beyond the book. Um, we're gifting to you when you buy the course now. And, um, we also, We'll see you. We also sell to Finland. I see we have a Finland in here, a Finnish person. Um, so, friends, all right, see you at 2 o'clock, which is just a few minutes from now. So, friends, until we meet again, thanks for joining me. Ciao.